Welcome everyone to a new wave. Today's session is going to be focusing on the US experience of intravascular lithotripsy and calcium modification. I'm joined by an amazing panel of speakers and friends, which includes Bobby Ye from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, uh, Richard Schlopmitz from St. Francis Hospital in Roslyn, Robert Riley from the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and Philippe Genero from Morristown Medical Center in New Jersey. I'm Ziad Ali. I'm from St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. And we hope to provide you about an hour's worth of deep dive into the experience of IVL into the US. But we're actually gonna start by talking about the mechanism of action. And um, I literally need no introduction because I just introduced myself. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys about riding the wave, a deep dive into IVL's mechanism of action. Okay, so now this is still the low energy. So this is fall of 2009 on a Sunday evening in an hourly rental lab somewhere in Mountain View, California with a MacGyvered lithotripsy device. The voice you're hearing is John Adams, who's the brainchild of intravascular lithotripsy. With eggs from Safeway or from John Adams Ranch in Seattle and a recording on an iPhone 1. And what you hear is quotes like, it's doing something. Looks like it blew a hole yeah. in the back side. What we're seeing is the front side of the membrane. I think this is going to work. So some 11 years later, we've made a lot of progress, but it started with this sort of hallelujah moment where we noted that the lithotriptor actually fractured the outside of the eggshell, but maintained the inner membrane completely intact. So in fact, this had the possibility of being soft on soft and hard on hard. And this is where we are 11 years later. Shockwave is now integrated into a balloon and uses a mechanism of action whereby expanding and collapsing vapor bubbles create a short burst of acoustic pressure waves. These acoustic pressure waves give a karate chop style 50 atmospheres of pressure into the wall. And this localized field effect leads to calcium fracture, maximizing vascular compliance. And this is critical for lesion preparation before stent expansion. To really understand the mechanism of action of shockwave, of course, it's based on extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy used for kidney stones. And so to understand this, the way this works is basically a spark plug, which has two electrodes, creates a spark between the two electrodes and in a parabolic fashion, it concentrates and focuses the energy. So it's a little bit important to understand how the parabolic part works. It's kind of like your car headlights. You notice that there's a concave or parable of mirrors inside the light. And what that does is it takes all of the reflection and concentrates it so that you get a straight beam rather than spreading the light everywhere. Shock waves are no different. You start off with a bipolar electrode. The first shock wave is focused energy, and that's how you get to very high atmospheric pressures. Then you get a second wave, which is the expanding cavitation bubble. As this cavitation bubble actually collapses, it releases a second shock wave, a liquid jet, which causes shearing stresses. And this is the way you break kidney stones. So on the right panel, you see a short, sudden rise, which happens in about 10 milliseconds. This is a compressive stress. And then there's a negative peak pressure tensile stress followed by a secondary rise. Let's be a little bit more specific now. When we look at the mechanisms of calcium fracture using shockwave intravascular lithotripsy, it starts off similarly with a compressive stress, but in this situation, the energy is unfocused. Okay, so there's no parable. This unfocused energy is diffuse and as a result can be lower in magnitude. That generates the initial fractures. Once it actually gets into the calcium, you get shear stress from the shock wave and from the cavitation bubble, which leads to these microjets and heat, which go through the calcium and then there's a small stress because by the time the wave hits the back wall, it actually reflects at the rear of the calcium, inverting the pressure, creating a pulling effect. The tensile strength leads to cavitation-induced microjets and heats, 
And finally, there's a squeezing stress, which is squeezing either sides of the calcium from the edges. These are the five mechanisms that are likely involved in calcium fracture and vascular compliance and intravascular lithotripsy. And so what you see is some of the differences between extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which is this high peak magnitude, followed by this second wave. You'll notice, in fact, somewhat counterintuitively that the IVL is much, much less energy, but that's important. Because if you go ahead and look on the left table here, you'll see that the amount of focused energy created by the ESWL is 300 to 1100 atmospheres. So this would obviously be very risky in terms of perforation and could literally blow things into smithereens. Even the peak negative pressure is very, very high. And even focused intracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy can provide probably too much energy and is uncontrolled. But this is more akin to what's happening in intravascular lithotripsy, where the peak positive pressure is approximately 50 atmospheres. The negative pressure is only three atmospheres. And that negative pressure is important because this is what's happening at the back wall of the calcium, close to the adventitia. We want to lose energy there so that we don't lead to perforation into the adventitial space. But the penetration depth of acoustic pressure wave is about three to seven millimeters. More of that on the next slide. And I already mentioned to you the primary mechanisms of calcium fracture. Now, this is why it's important in terms of the field effect. And that really clinically means about balloon sizing. So balloon sizing with IVL should be done 1.1 to 1. Of course, the only way to really know how big an artery is is to use intracoronary imaging. But even if you're using the angiogram, you want to be generous in your sizing. Because what you'll see in panel A is the larger the balloon, the bigger the field effect. The smaller the balloon, the smaller the field effect. And in fact, understanding the spatial distribution of the electrodes, which we'll talk about shortly, allows you to do something called pulse management. More on this in the next slide. But what you'll notice is overall in disrupt PAV, if you use the optimal technique, you had a much better primary patency and target lesion revascularization compared to the overall results. Now, this is what I was talking to you about the field effect and understanding the acoustic peak pressure aligns with the emitter location. So immediately perpendicular to the emitter, you get the maximum amount of energy. These two electrodes are diametrically opposing pairs. So they're actually going off in the other direction. And that's how you get this balanced field effect. It's worthwhile understanding the differences between the different peripheral and coronary catheters. And you'll notice, for example, in the M5 catheter, there's a higher peak energy in the middle electrode. And that's because this middle electrode is its own channel. Usually, one, the channels are split between the two electrodes distally and proximally. And this is the mechanism of action in video form. This unfocused lithotripsy energy is created at the emitters, which are contained in a fluid-filled coupler. That's the balloon. The electrical energy is delivered to the emitter, initiating the steam bubble, which expands and collapses, creating the sonic pressure wave. And so what we can do is finally prove that this is one of the technology, despite all the hype of many of the others, is truly soft on soft and hard on hard. And the reason is that the acoustic impedance of water and soft tissue is actually dramatically similar. But the acoustic impedance of things like bone or calcium are 10 times higher. And that's why the energy that's emitted seems to impact this calcium and, for example, bone in a much more meaningful way. And so in English, Intravascular lithotripsy is a karate chop. It's a sudden, focused, high energy impact compared to what we see with ultra high pressure, non-compliant or specialty balloons, which is more analogous to this weightlifter, where it's a slow sustained energy that requires, first of all, the ability to start. You need to take off in a momentum early. And this is why what dog boning happens because the balloon does not have enough space to actually expand. 
the mechanism of action of calcium fracture is actually a little bit more complicated than we originally thought. This is a micro CT from the superficial femoral artery, which shows that the calcium fractures actually are not only linear, but happen in a haphazard and uncontrolled way because of this unfocused energy. And this is critical because while we're used to seeing calcium fractures in a linear form in OCT, it is likely that there are fractures that are happening in other tangential spaces, which also facilitate stent expansion. Here you can see on this micro CT, what looks like the roof being blown off the house. These are not necessary as uh, uh, linear fractures. And this is what I was talking about. It, linear fractures are more often evident on OCT in the coronary space because we're looking at an axial cross section, but that doesn't mean that fractures are not occurring in other tangential spaces. Nonetheless, the mechanism of action is indeed calcium fracture. And the calcium fracture liberates the artery from its stenosis, as you can see from pre-procedure to post-IDL, and then finally leads to significantly further luminal gain when moving from post-IDL to post-stent. What happens with the post-stent is it actually creates a space between this calcium fracture and these tectonic plates move from each other. And this space actually fills with fibrous tissue. It does not reheal as calcium. And this is the mechanism by which we regain some uh, uh, vascular compliance in the long run. There are multiple studies. In fact, the first ever a manuscript on intravascular lithotripsy at that time called lithoplasty was an OCT characteristics of this. We again showed it uh, that OCT's predominant uh, mechanism of action of IDL is in fact calcium fracture. And Richard Schlofnitz presented the OCT3 sub-study and we'll be talking to you later on about the role of intravascular imaging um, in maximizing uh, your output with IDL using a technique called pulse management. You should all be familiar with the different uh, equipment. Uh, it comes with a generator, uh, a connector cable and the catheter, which is all packaged together. And finally, the balloon. It's important to understand the spatial uh, distribution of the markers within the balloon. This is a 12 millimeter balloon and the space between the radiopaque marker of the balloon and the first electrode is four millimeters. Then there's a six millimeter gap to the second electrode and then a two millimeter gap until the final marker band. And this is a summary of the different um, currently available vascular compliance or modifying calcium modifying technologies, all of which have their own advantages and disadvantages. These are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are going to be synergistic but you'll see that some of the benefits of intravascular lithotripsy are you can use the wire of your choice. You eliminate wire bias. You don't have to worry about things like side branch protection. There are very, very few uh, complications currently in the, in the literature. So in summary, IVL utilizes electrical energy to generate acoustic pressure waves, which impact calcium. Acoustic pressure impacts calcium by many mechanisms. Compared to ESWL and ISWL, the ideal energy is lower, and that's a good thing because its goal is to fracture but not pulverize the calcium. You have to get the balloon size right, ideally using intravascular imaging at 1.1 to 1, and you need to understand the spatial placement of the separation of the electrodes to help with pulse management, which Rich Lofnitz will talk about later in this uh, new wave. The mechanism of calcium fracture is an acoustic pulse. It's short and sharp. In vitro and in vivo studies confirm that the calcium fracture mechanism improves vascular compliance. And it's no doubt that intravascular lithotripsy is going to be an important tool for modification of coronary calcium in the future. Thank you very much. I hope that was interesting. So Ziad, um, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. Um, one of the questions I had was, um, what are some of the initial challenges that were overcome in the development of the technology? Well, actually, Rob, the probably the biggest challenge was getting funding for this. This was uh, 2009. It was just after um, the 2008 mini depression, I would say. And, and so it, it was quite difficult to get funding for this. But that was also in some ways a blessing in disguise because it required us to do a lot more diligence um, with the mechanism of action, uh, with the potential side effects of this device. 
a lot of the uh, initial interest was in the heat that was generated uh, by this technology and whether that could lead to restenosis somewhat like laser uh, and cryotherapy did in the past. Um, but probably the most technically challenging feature was initially the amount of energy that came out of the emitter would, would burst every balloon. And the brainchild of this, John Adams worked very hard to figure out a mechanism by which to change the amplitude of the energy that was delivered so that it was more of a resonance and it wouldn't lead to balloon um, uh, disruption. Um, so that was probably the biggest one that took a little bit of challenge, but these things are usually more iterative, small challenges, sort of one at a time that you take on piece by piece. Cool question. Um, so we're gonna move on now and uh, to Bobby A from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. The proof is in the plaque and he's gonna talk to you about the disrupt CAD3 clinical trial results putting into context some of uh, the clinical evidence. Thanks so much, Ziad, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. It's important to remember that Disrupt C83 is one of several trials for the shockwave device. It's the largest trial, and it's the one that supported uh, the US IDE and PMA approvals for the device. Uh, and I'm gonna speak a little bit about it. 384 patients, 47 sites conducted in both the US and EU. And of course, there was an OCT sub-study that included 100 patients. The design of the study, uh, it included heavily patients with heavily calcified de novo coronary lesions uh, of 2.5 to 4.0 in reference vessel diameter, uh, lesion lengths less than 40. And then each site was allowed one roll-in patient, so 47 roll-in patients at one at each site, followed by the intention to treat population of 384 patients. Uh, the primary endpoint was studied at 30 days, but there is ongoing one year and two year follow up in the study. Here were the baseline characteristics of the patients. Uh, you see that it's a very typical stable CAD population with some exceptions. High uh, elderly, uh, for the most part, elderly patients, predominantly men with coronary risk factors. But the thing that really jumps out at you is because these are very calcified arteries, a really high a percentage of patients with chronic renal insufficiency, which we know is a risk factor for coronary calcification. Angina class, predominantly class two and three angina. Here were the angiographic characteristics. More than half of these lesions were in the LAD, uh, with the remainder predominantly in the right coronary and the CERC. Uh, the reference vessel diameter, 3.0 uh, millimeters on average, and the minimum lumen diameter, 1.1. So the diameter stenosis by QCA, uh, about 65% on average. You can see the calcified lengths, extremely calcified, uh, long lesions, 47.9 uh, calcified length on average with severe calcification, of course, in all patients. Here were the procedural characteristics. Uh, I think the notable thing here is that 99% of the stents were able to be delivered here and post dilation occurred in 99, again, also 99% uh, percent of patients. It's about 1.3 uh, stents per patient. You see here also that the number of catheters used were about a little bit more than one on average uh, with about 68 pulses and a maximum inflation pressure as per the protocol of six uh, atmospheres. This is what happened first pre-procedure and then post IVL and finally after the stent. You can see that IVL itself does reduce uh, the percent diameter stenosis significantly. You can see that in the right graph where the, uh, the shift of the stenosis moves. Uh, to more and more greater uh, lumen diameter. And then ultimately the, the intent of IVL is to enable or facilitate placement of a stent uh, and optimization of a stent. And so you can see the final result here, uh, excellent results with very little diameter stenosis after the final stent was placed. Very low rates of angiographic complications here by core lab analysis. Immediately post IVL, 2.6% for any angiographic complication, predominantly those comprised of type D through F uh, dissections. Uh, of course, those dissections were stented over and you can see the final results were very good post stent with very, very low rates of angiographic complications. The study had a, a primary safety and as well as a primary efficacy hypothesis test for the safety endpoint uh, was 30 day MACE comprised of cardiac death, MI or TVR. Uh, this was a single arm study uh, so there was a performance scroll. And you can see here that the lower confidence interval of the observed 30-day uh, MACE was well above the say, cleared the safety performance goal. So highly significant uh, p-value meeting the performance safety endpoint. 
Similarly, for the primary effectiveness endpoint, which was uh, the combination of stent delivery with residual stenosis less than 50% and without in-hospital MACE, the performance score was set at 83.4%, and the final results easily cleared that bar with a lower confidence limit of 90.2% with a highly significant uh, performance goal p-value. Here are the in-hospital and 30-day MACE rates. In-hospital and 30-day rates were actually similar to one another because most of these events were in-hospital as well as they were comprised of, for the most part, non-Q-wave or periprocedural myocardial infarctions, very low rates of cardiac death, as might be expected, uh, low rates of target vessel revascularization or substantive Q-wave MIs. Here are some of the secondary endpoints. Uh, as I stated earlier, the device is really intended to facilitate uh, ultimately procedural success with stenting. The device itself crossed in more than 95% of cases. There was angiographic, high rates of angiographic uh, and procedural success seen here. Now, one thing that did arise that people have been uh, asking about is IVL induced induced capture phenomena. So uh, IVL itself releases a mechanical electrical, uh, a, a mechanical energy that can lead to mechanical electrical coupling with acoustic, acoustic pressure waves that leads to ventricular capture. This was seen here in about, uh, about 40% of patients. Uh, but it's important to know that none of these patients had sustained ventricular arrhythmias or clinical sequelae. Uh, and in fact, while there was a slight drop in blood pressure observed during the ventricular uh, pacing induced capture, this drop in blood pressure was actually quite similar uh, to those patients who did not have any IVL induced capture who also had declines in their systolic blood pressure during the procedure. So what does the learning curve looks like, look like with this device? Well, if you had a chance to use it, you know this is standard balloon tech in terms of how uh, the operator uh, interacts with it. And as you might expect, if you've used it, uh, it's quite easy. There was essentially no learning curve observable. The freedom from MACE, procedural sex, success rates, and device crossing success, all similar for the very first case that any of the operators did uh, compared to uh, all the remainder of the cases. So there was an OCT sub-study for the study. And in, in this, uh, this sub-study, OCT was performed pre-procedure, immediately post-IVL, and immediately post-stent delivery. Uh, this was done in 100 of the patients, uh, some of whom were the roll-in patients and the ITT patients. And from OCT, we learned, I think, what we knew from the angiographic data, that there was really significant calcium here. The maximum calcium angle, um, almost, uh, almost 300 here, maximum calcium thickness, uh, almost a millimeter. And then post-stent, despite this significant calcification, uh, OCT, uh, examined stent expansion was more than 100% on average with really large uh, minimal stented areas and, and very few malopost stent struts. Uh, calcium fracture can be observed on OCT in about two thirds of the lesion post IVL. And you can see here the breakdown that there's uh, at least one fracture in some patients, multiple fractures in actually the majority. And then if, in some patients, no observable fracture uh, by OCT. Uh, what was really interesting about the fracture characteristics is that whether or not there was observable fracture on OCT, uh, there was consistent minimum stented area, stent expansion, and area stenosis outcomes, you know, regardless of this. So it really suggests that in some ways that uh, the visualization of fracture is not a necessary requirement uh, for you to, get, to have good results post-IVL. You know, these are uh, micro CT. Uh, hist and histologic images of what these fractures look like. And as Ziad has mentioned already, you can tell that these character these fractures are not just a single fracture, but they they are you know multiple fractures that move longitudinally uh, and as well as uh, in terms of depth. Uh, and you can see that these fractures are really represent what we know to be an important process uh, in 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 disrupting uh, these these highly uh, unyielding lesions. So in conclusion, Disrupt C83 uh, trial success was achieved as both for both the primary safety and efficacy endpoints. Uh, these were met. Coronary IVL prior to DES implantation was well tolerated with a low rate of periprocedural uh, clinical and angiographic complications. And this study represents the initial IVL experience in the US. Nevertheless, there was high procedural success, low angiographic complication rates. It reflects the relative ease of use of this technology.
Finally, OCT demonstrated both longitudinal and circumferential calcium fractures, although this require, the presence of these fractures was not a requirement uh, for stent, uh, excellent stent outcomes. Thanks very much and, uh, and look forward to hearing the next presentation. Thanks, Bobby. That was a fantastic summary of the Disrupt CAD3 results. And I think probably one of the things that's the most interesting is, is the profound safety that's been coming up over and over again in the CAD series of trials. But, but let me ask you my one shocking question instead of burning question. Um, IDL induced ventricular capture. Uh, what is it? How often does it occur in CAD3? And what's the concern? Is this clinically relevant? Is there subgroups of patients we should be really worried about? It's a great question, Ziad. And I spoke a little bit about it during my presentation. But what it is, is that during the pulse delivery for IVL, mechanical energy is delivered. And uh, that mechanical energy can actually be translated and coupled to electrical energy that, that results in ventricular capture. So important to remember first that it is not electrical energy that is being delivered with IVL, but it's mechanical en energy. Uh, the second is that uh, it occurred about 40% of the time in patients who received IVL. Uh, and so it's a frequent, uh, not an infrequent occurrence. In particular, it was more relevant in patients who uh, were bradycardic at baseline. That seems to be one risk factor for it being observed. Um, and finally, it's important to note that none of those patients who had IVL-induced ventricular capture sustained any adverse consequence of it, apart from perhaps some transient uh, uh, decline in systolic blood pressure. But even then there, the decline in systolic blood pressure was observed, uh, one, it recovered, and two, it was no greater than uh, the frequently observed declines in systolic blood pressure that we get uh, during routine angioplasty. And then that was true in the trial as well. So um, that's what the phenomenon is and how frequent it is. And, and I think really the key takeaway is that although common, uh, it doesn't seem to result in any adverse consequences. So it's my um, real honor and pleasure to introduce next my boss, uh, Richard Schlafmitz, the best boss in the world. Um, seeing is believing benefits of imaging with intravascular lipotripsy. Thank you, Ziad, for that wonderful introduction. Today, I'll be talking about intravascular lithotripsy and OCT using precision PCI, focusing on pulse management. These are my disclosures. So when we do interventional procedures, we use an OCT algorithm, MLD Max, where we look at morphology, length, and diameter to strategize how we're going to attack that vessel before we do the angioplasty and stenting. And then afterwards, we optimize assessing for medial dissection, apposition, and expansion. And we also use co-registration, so we know exactly where we're placing our stent or focusing on calcium. Today, I'll be talking about optimizing intravascular lithotripsy using OCT. And I sort of uh, use a different word for OCT. I call it optimizing calcified targets using pulse management. What does that mean? It means we assess the morphology of all the calcified zones. We then pick a one-to-one -one size of the catheter to the vessel using the EEL. We use co-registration so we know exactly where to put our pulses to maximize our utilization. We always document fracture or try to document fracture before we put a stent in. And we assess the size and length post-shock fracture to get the precise length and size of the stent we're going to put in. After the procedure, we want to make sure we have a great result, so we look for luminal gain apposition and make sure there's no dissection. So what design devices are available and how do you know when to use what? The traditional techniques include non-compliant balloons, cutting balloons and scoring balloons. And the calcium modification techniques include rotational atherectomy, orbital atherectomy, lithotripsy and eczema laser atherectomy. And we sort of coin these um, as roll or non-roll. And you know what to use based on the imaging. Using OCT, you could see that there's three types of calcium. There's deep calcium, where you have a fibrotic layer in the lumen. You have superficial calcium, where the calcium is touching the lumen, and you have nodular calcium. And depending upon the type of calcium you have, determines which is the best treatment or pretreatment to attack your calcium. You see in non-roll, you can use scoring balloons, cutting balloons, potentially even lithotripsy. In roll, if you meet certain criteria, clearly rotational orbital atherectomy or lithotripsy are quite useful. And for nodular calcium, 
atherectomy with rotational orbital and possibly lithotripsy can be useful. So just looking a little closer at deep calcium, there is a fibrotic layer, it's non-luminal. Here you could use a balloon and potentially lithotripsy to get the deep calcium fracture. With superficial calcium, there's minimal to no um, fibrotic layer present and um, the depth of calcium is measurable. Here, if you have deep calcium and it's greater than 180 degrees, techniques such as atherectomy, lithotripsy, rotoblader, or CSI are quite useful in cracking that calcium so you can get stent expansion. Calcified nodules are a very difficult um, type of calcium to treat. They're luminally protrusive. Um, thrombus can be on the surface. They act like uh, unstable lesions. And here, CSI is what I find is quite good, but rotational atherectomy and IVL potentially have a role as well. You need to know what a normal vessel looks like. And we go to the EEL to get the size of the vessel. And you see that this is important because for optimal intravascular lysotripsy energy dispersing, you want one-to-one -one balloon sizing. You want the balloon against the wall. So you want to get the correct size of the balloon to um, your vessel. And you also know that the emitters are not centrally placed at the markers. So you want to use pulse management to move the balloon exactly where you get the most energy described. This is just an example of calcium fracture just at four atmospheres. You see in the pre-IVL, the luminal area is 2.45 and has almost circumferential calcium. Just at four atmospheres in a heavily calcified vessel, we went from 245 to 399. And with stent expansion, we go to 572. And at St. Francis, we use an algorithm for calcified lesions. We look at OCT to guide us which way to go. If you can cross with the OCT catheter, as mentioned before, you can see if you have deep superficial and nodule calcium. And as you follow this algorithm down, you see that if you have superficial calcium and you have greater than 180 degree arc, greater than five millimeters long and 0.5 millimeters thickness, and you can cross with a balloon, our preferred treatment is IVL. We always document the calcium fracture and then look at the stent and get a final OCT. But what about the cases that you can't cross with an OCT? Well, chances are you're not gonna be able to cross with a balloon, and then you're gonna use some type of atherectomy device. But just because you use orbital atherectomy or rotational atherectomy, doesn't mean you have calcium fracture and you need to document this. And sometimes we use a combined technique with this and IVL to get real good fracture. The unknown is deep calcium, I think IVL may have a role here. So this is the algorithm we follow step by step. So I'm gonna show you a case now using precision PCI with post management. This is a gentleman who underwent um, orbital atherectomy in the LED earlier in the month, and now comes in for a stage procedure to the RCA. We're gonna do our pre-OCT assessment. We're gonna do our post IVC um, IVL assessment with OCT and look at a final stent. So here you see calcium in the mid right coronary artery. And although you see a wall of calcium there, there isn't anybody watching this who could really tell me what's happening inside the vessel. Calcified lesions can be seen on angiography, but they're underestimated and the type of morphology is impossible to recognize without an imaging device. So we go through our algorithm. The top left is the angiographic screen. The right is cross-sectional. And we want to see is calcium present. And you can see on the cross-sectional quite clearly that calcium is present in this situation. Then we're going to want to know the length of the calcium, and we can actually measure the depth of the calcium quite precisely, as well as the R. So we find the MLA, and see from there we scan both distally and proximally. Here we see the length of the calcium is greater than five millimeters. Now we're going to measure the depth. We could also see the size of the vessel, but we're going to measure the depth of the calcium. And using um, the cross-sectional um, marker on the top right, we can find a nice calcified lesion and measure different arcs of calcium. Here you see it's 0.76 and 0.66. Clearly deep calcium, greater than five millimeters in length. And we're gonna see that the arc of calcium is greater than 180 degrees. So if you follow our algorithm, we have a CVI score of four with superficial calcium. We're gonna to try to use IVL in this situation. And here you just see the arc of the calcium magnified. Clearly you cannot tell that from an angiogram alone. So we go ahead and we see that we get a distal reference. 
we get our MLA. And if you look at that MLA, you see it's a combination of superficial calcium with a little nodule sticking out and our proximal reference. And we can measure here that our length of our stent is 23 millimeters and we can get a size. So we know beforehand that we're gonna to need to use some type of ablative technique, in this case, IBL. We know the length and the size of the stent. In treatment area one, our balloon expands at eight pulses at four atmospheres. And you see how calcified that vessel was. We go through our steps. And now post IVL, we want to see if we have fracture. So here you see that um, we have calcium fracture on the left at um, 10 o'clock, at nine o'clock, and angiographically, you have a nice vessel there. Now we're going to look at our OCT post assessment. We look to see, do we have edge dissection? Here we see our distal edge looks good. We're going to go proximally and make sure there's no edge dissection proximally. Once I know my edges are okay, I know I'm basically done and I should have optimization because I knew the size of my vessel before so I can optimize it with a balloon before. I want to look at expansion. The software that you see here is somewhat older, but the new software actually breaks it up and gives you area stenosis distally and proximally immediately without having to manipulate it yourself. But here you see we have 0% um, uh, stenosis distally and proximally greater than 90%. As per the Luminium 3 guidelines, we try to get greater than 90% expansion. So I have expansion. Now, apposition is quite easy. That's seen by automatic software showing us that our stent is expanded um, and has apposition. If the white bar on the rented stent button is um, there, you know that you're less than 200 micrograms off the wall. So I have edge assessment, expansion, and apposition. This is precision PCI with IBL. So in summary, IBL with pulse management gives me morphology to assess if it's deep. It lets me know the length of the calcium, the arc of the calcium, and the depth of the calcium. I can assess the length of stent. I look for normal to normal. I get the size of the stent and my balloon. I'm gonna have one-to-one -one IBL to my EEL. I can co-register, so I put the pulses only to calcified lesions. And I could place my stent exactly and resize in length if necessary after IBL. I can detect distal and proximal edge dissection, luminal gain, and evaluate apposition. This is how you use precision angioplasty to attack calcified lesions with IVL and OCT. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. I think this concept of pulse management is going to be really important as we move forward. And, you know, I think we all have a lot to learn from you. I don't think anyone maybe in the world has much experience with intravascular lithotripsy clinically as you do in the real world. Um, you're now approaching a hundred cases. So tell us about the calcium burden. How much does it matter? Uh, and how much calcium do you need to induce fracture? And does that matter? Uh, I, I think we understand more calcium, the better, but tell us your experience with your vast experience of intravascular imaging and uh, understanding calcium fracture and IDL? Well, Z, you know that when you have a calcified lesion, those are the situations where you get an inadequate result if you don't pretreat. So the first lesson to learn is that the only way to understand calcium is to image. Whether you use OCT or IBIS, you need to image to know what type of calcium you're dealing with. And then afterwards, did you pretreat it? Because if you don't treat calcium with respect, you're going to have restenosis, and then you're going to have misery afterwards. So the first lesson is image the calcium, make sure that you've pretreated it so you can get a great stent result. Now, the nice thing about lithotripsy with calcium is that many people are afraid of calcium and they try to go the easy step by just ballooning it and muscling through. Because the techniques that were currently available, such as um, OCT, uh, CSI or rotablator, can be somewhat um, challenging for uh, an operator that's not that busy. The beauty of IVL is that it's easy to use. If you know how to use a balloon, you can use I IVL and it's safe. You don't have any distal embolization, you don't have arrhythmias, you don't have no reflow phenomenon, you don't have perforation. So the, the MACE events are extremely small. So it's easy to use and it's safe to use. When do we use it though? And what we're finding is in the study that we were in, clearly greater than 270 degree calcium, you get great fracture and expansion. And even if you don't see the fracture with OCT, you get great expansion because there are probably micro fractures. So greater than 270 to me, if you can cross with it, you should use it. It's a great product. Less than 270, we're looking at it right now. Clearly I'm seeing fractures with nodular calcium, but frankly, we're not seeing um, the 
uh, calcium nodule being um, shaved off like I do with CSI, but that remains to be seen. We're doing an analysis of 90 degree, 180, 270. So we're looking at everything, but the beauty of it is it's that it's easy to use and safe to use. Well, that was great. Um, Rich, uh, we're gonna move on now to Rob Riley uh, from Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. Um, case in point, an IVL case. And Rob's gonna focus on uh, talking to us about high-risk patients with complex disease. Rob, take it away. Thank you so much, Ziad and everybody else uh, for having me out today and letting me share uh, a recent case I did. So these are my disclosures. So this is a really interesting case. This is actually a female uh, who presented at the end of the week prior to uh, IVL being uh, commercially available in the United States. Uh, we didn't know that at the time. Uh, she came in with CAD risk factors uh, with symptoms concerning for unstable angina. Uh, Pre-procedure echo showed severe AS, severe MR, and EF of 20%. And she's referred for coronary angiography and a left and right heart cath. So you can see the, the right heart cath numbers, relatively uvolemic biventricular, RA6, wedge of 12, an index that's a little bit borderline of two with a power that's a little bit borderline of 0.6. So during the diagnostic angiography, they did FFR, that prox LED lesion, which was significant. They also did FFR, this OM1, which was not significant. And the RCA didn't have any really significant disease. So it was then, uh, unfortunately had a stroke after the diagnostic angiogram. On uh, retrospective looks at CTs uh, afterwards during all of her evaluation for her stroke, there's a big significant atheroma burden at the brachiocephalic insertion and in the aortic root. So unfortunately, uh, you know, she took a couple of days to kind of resolve from that. During that time, we had a heart team approach uh, has how to take care of her multivalvular disease and her prox LED disease. She was turned down for surgery due to multiple different comorbidities, not the least of which being her recent stroke. And the plan was to start with aortic valve disease with TAVR, but they did ask for coronary vascularization prior to the TAVR. There was a big concern about uh, doing a significant atherectomy. You can see there's significant calcium on both sides of the vessel here. This would be somebody who would have been enrolled in Disrupt C83. So there's a big concern, however, of, you know, we didn't have with a Tripsy at the time. Is she going to tolerate big burr atherectomy? Because again, it's a pretty big vessel. Uh, without mechanical circulatory support. We were significantly concerned about using mechanical circulatory support because of the big atheroma burden in her root. Uh, and so actually a few days later, uh, IVL was approved in the United States. And so that's actually what we ended up going with. So as you can see here, we started off with OCT, which you can see despite a little bit of the swirl up here is that there's significant coronary calcium through uh, this lesion here. And you can see it's very thick, very dense. And that obviously requires, based on any algorithm that you want to look at, some sort of coronary uh, calcium solution there. So in this case, with no predilation, we went straight with the one to one size shockwave balloon delivery. And what was interesting, again, severe AS, severely depressed EF, severe MR. This patient didn't blink an eye. They had a little bit of pulse pressure reduction during the therapy, a little bit of T-wave uh, T elevation, but it remained uh, asymptomatic throughout the entire thing. You would see these changes about seven or eight pulses into the delivery, and then it would resolve about five to 10 seconds after we stopped doing the delivery. So we were a little bit slower in delivering all 80 pulses uh, because of these changes, but again, rock stable throughout the entire procedure. You can see here, we were in a six French guide, after that, we were able to sort of re-image, see that the vessel was prepared adequately, place a single stent, and the patient tolerated it without any real hemodynamic perturbation, no symptoms, and did great. She then went on to get her TAVR and was able to be discharged in very stable condition. So in some of the learning points from this case, while relatively simple, it really took a very potentially complex case and made it much, much simpler, both for the operator and the patient. So some of the learning points always image, for vessel size, lesion length, a need for calcium solutions, and then after stents for post-MSA sizing. In patients where other calcium solutions might be a little bit touch and go, IVL can be very helpful. And it can be very helpful in larger vessels, especially like this, uh, where you may have to rely on uh, sort of the biasing of the atherectomy device. Instead, you can just go straight to IVL, which you know is gonna give you that 360 degree treatment. So thank you guys again so much for having me. Rob, that was a fantastic case. And I think really highlights the safety of this, not only in terms of perforation and slow flow and no reflow, 
but also the safety intra-procedurally uh, that you can do these very complex cases in a very predictable manner. So on that note, having been involved in the trial, tell us your real world versus clinical trial experience. What are you learning in your first IVL cases in real world patients that can be helpful? That's a great question. Um, I think first and foremost, you know, many of the concerns we have about the delivery of the device uh, are proving to be um, not as big a deal as we thought. We're able to take this device pretty much anywhere it needs to go, sometimes with small predilation, but again, it's very deliverable. We're able to take it, you know, after delivering some shocks in one place, even into branches. So an unwrapped balloon is still able to be uh, delivered over a second wire into branches and things like that. Uh, we're finding that, you know, true to form and the uh, pair procedural uh, adverse event rates we saw in Disrupt CAD3, we're really not seeing much of anything in terms of major adverse events, no uh, major dissections, no slow reflow, these types of things. So we're finding that the device is, as you already pointed out, easy to use, very safe to use, and really is simplifying some of these very complex procedures. Okay, so we're going to move on now to Philippe Genero, case in point, an IVL case. And, and Philippe's going to show us uh, the advantages of IVL in bifurcation disease and how he integrates IVL uh, into the current workflow. Well, thank you so much, Ziad, for having me here. And I want to thank um, Shockwave to uh, put together such a wonderful uh, webinar. Um, I'm happy to uh, discuss on behalf of Morristown Medical Center team uh, our usage of IVL, and especially in a subset of lesion, I believe uh, Shockwave uh, has a big advantage, which is calcified bifurcation. So it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, I'm very glad that I came and learned a lot from previous speaker. So here are my, uh, my disclosure. So first of all, our experience at Morristown Medical Center, uh, we started six weeks ago and we already have more than 40 cases. Uh, we perform uh, IVL shockwave on, on various clinical setup and presentation. We did STEMI, non-STEMI shock, left main, also lesion, multiple vessel disease, uh, ISR, restenosis with previously underexpanded stent, uh, and also bifurcation. And it occurred to me that uh, seeing that shockwave has a very good role in this subset of lesion, and I'm gonna try to show you why. So this is a recent case that I had uh, the pleasure to do. I was a 69 years old uh, male, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, is a long cancer survivor in 2014, he had a right Lower, uh, lower lobectomy. And he described for the last six months progressive angina, CCS two out of four, which uh, accelerate to three out of four. So I saw the patient and performed the initial angiogram. And as you can see, there's an intermediate lesion uh, of the um, RCA and also intermediate lesion of the OM1. Um, You can see also the mid LED had a very severely calcified um, lesion, approximately 70% visually. As you can see on the still frame, you have a lot of calcium um, both sides of the vessel, and that's involved, uh, I will say, medium sized first diagonal. So, a true bifurcation lesion, very uh, calcified. So, just to show you actually here, the patient was turned down for surgery. Uh, because of this porcelain, very calcified aorta. So the plan for this uh, patient was to first assess physiologically speaking the RCA and the OM1. I was not convinced that these lesions needed to be addressed. Um, second, perform a PCR, the LAD and D1, uh, physiologic guided. And I think this, the highlight of this case is we can use any 014 wire, a regular wire with shockwave. And in this case, I think it's very useful to use a physiology wire. And I'm using the absence uh, wire. We switched completely to the system with a very good success. And we uh, elected to perform IVL shockwave of the uh, LAD. So first, uh, no surprise, the absence of the three wire uh, told us that the mid RC was non-significant uh, with a, P, a DPR of 098. After that, we went to the OM1, and also the OM1 was non-significant with the uh, OptoWire 3, uh, so we treated immediately also. So now we ended up with actually a proximate LED uh, in bifurcation. So this is the DPR, the LED. So I wired the lesion with the, uh, the 
FFR wire, actually, with the absence of the three wire. Uh, and the, obviously, it was severely depressed. So the DPR was 0.7 E. So it's positive when it's less than 0.89. And I use a regular wire, Scion uh, uh, blue in the uh, diagonal with no problem. <clears throat> and you can see here, we start to predilate with compliant balloon 2.5, 2.5 with no uh, difficulty. Then we brought a 3.0 non-compliant balloon, and you can see severely underexpanded uh, non-compliant balloon. And this is where we uh, elected to bring the IVL uh, catheter. So over the uh, absence up to three wire, over the physiology wire, we brought the up uh, the uh, shockwave balloon. As you can see, very good tracking, no problem to deliver the uh, shockwave 3.0 balloon. And obviously the wire is still in place in the diagonal and that can be useful actually for uh, body wire if you have an issue. Then we perform a multiple inflation and uh, lithotripsy with a 3.0 shockwave. As you can see the lesion open nicely, still uh, on the absence physiology wire. And this is post shockwave. You see that the lesion is, the lesion is already um, um, better expanded. And then we uh, put two drug lutein stent, one in the mid uh, LED and one in the prox LED. Uh, we post dilate the prox LED with a non-compliant 3.5 at 26 atmosphere. And we fi uh, finish with a kissing inflation at 3.5 in the LED and a 2.5 uh, in the diagonal. Um, at this point, the uh, FFR wire, the absence wire is still in the LED. So we could assess actually uh, the uh, result with the physiology after. And this is the final result. You can see very well expanded stand, very well opposed uh, and with an open uh, diagonal. So we were very satisfied. So this is the summary of the case. Uh, we perform um, LAD D1 shockwave uh, physiology guided. I know uh, Richard Schlossmith really like uh, um, OCT and imaging, but I believe the advantage of the shockwave is you can work on your regular wire and not change a workflow. And, and I use here an, an FFR wire, the opto three wire from absence, uh, and, 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 and with a very confirmed and very good result with post BCI a DPR 096, which is normal. And also after the case, I pull back the absence wire, wire easily the side branch with a good result, DPR at 094, so we don't need a two-stand approach. So in summary, uh, why IVL shockwave and bifurcation? Well, the key, uh, the key here is it's preserved the standard workflow of uh, our regular bifurcation. We do everything on the, our standard 014 wire. Uh, and actually it's the only technology that can treat calcium on a standard workhorse wire um, compared to the other uh, competitor. And even on a physiology wire, which I believe would be a, a big deal if we want to optimize from a physiologically, uh, physiological point of view, um, the PCI we do with a FFR post uh, shockwave. And of course you can put an OCT on, on top of the absence wire, but I believe that uh, the, the, of view, the ease of use of the system, both shockwave and absence, make these two technology uh, very, very suitable for calcified bifurcation. Um, we preserve wire access to the side branch. We don't have to remove the wire to side branch to perform lithotripsy compared to the other competitor. Uh, you st still can use shockwave with dissection. And, 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 and finally, at the end of the day, really simplify the treatment of calcified bifurcation lesion, which I think is the big advantages. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna be open to question. And once again, thank you for having me here and to share my uh, early experience with this uh, great technology. So Philippe, tell us a little bit about the high value applications in addition to bifurcations. What other anatomical locations are well suited for IVL? Well, that's a good question, uh, Ziad. And um, I had the chance to use it in multiple uh, uh, setup and lesion. Um, one subset of lesion I really like, uh, I would say is a ACS, uh, acute coronary syndrome, uh, especially when there's some clot there. Uh, we're little reluctant to spin or to rotor blade in these lesions. So in STEMI or non-STEMI, whatever the lesion is, I think that's uh, probably a good tool. I had a limited experience with that. We, we did a few cases and the result was good. So I think that's in, in non-STEMI and STEMI, that could be a good tool to uh, expand lesion and stent. Uh, I did a couple of cases of left main. Uh, I know it's, uh, 
it's, it's maybe not um, approved or uh, for left main, it was not part of the study, but uh, osteo left main or osteo ACA or left main, uh, which is the biggest bifurcation actually, I think this is a great place because you, um, you're not unstable, you know, you st keep stability of the patient. Um, so, um, and you don't change the, the, your workflow. So for osteo lesion, especially RCA or left main, I think it's a very good tool. You can have the balloon half inside, half outside and, and still uh, achieve a, a, great, uh, a great setup. So um, I would say that this is the, 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 the area or location or setup that I use it. So bifurcation, osteo lesion, left main, so an ACS uh, where there's a thrombus. Well, Philippe, that was a fantastic case, uh, which really showed some of the workflow issues that can be very easily overcome with intravascular lithotripsy. In fact, there's very little learning curve and you can get started really very, very quickly. Philippe, um, you know, as the PI of Eclipse, you're obviously uh, very fast out with the orbital atherectomy. How uh, are you gonna decide what to use what now? What, you know, Rich showed an algorithm Tell us about your practical algorithm of, of, uh, of calcium modification. And specifically, do you think that um, there's an indication for using both besides for just crossing? Is, is the lesion preparation you can get adequate with atherectomy? And what are some of the limitations if there are any? That's a great question, and I, I, we're still learning about how to use this new tool. I mean, we, we've we been playing with this for six weeks, and especially when it's subocclusive, 90%, et cetera. When it's, uh, you know, not that tight, I, I think you can go primarily with, uh, with, with, with shockwave, um, and especially for complex cases. So I think for me, it's all about... Um, you know, how tight is the stenosis when you need to debulk in front? I think um, CSI or, or Roto is maybe the better tool. Um, I believe for big vessel large vessel. I think CSI may have a hedge here. Um, obviously, we're in a phase where we just uh, got a new tool. We're very excited to play with it, to learn the limit of it. Um, so I will say we pushed the limit lately with the shockwave. Um, but I think that will be my algorithm in the future. If it's very tight, I will use roto first and then maybe shockwave. So what we call rotolipsy, uh, I believe. Um, and if it's a large vessel, I think CSI could be good. But I will say that the ease of use, for the average operator, make Shockwave a very uh, compelling first choice if we don't have these element of complexity. Rich, um, let's take a hypothetical example. You have a 70 millimeter lesion in the LED and you know, distally you're 3.5, but proximally you're 4.0. One balloon or two balloons? So I, you, know, you, you wanna manage cost carefully. And um, so you, you wanna be careful with that. So. You know, um, it really depends if I'm truly 3.5 and 4.0 and there's severe calcium at both sides, circumferential calcium, I would go with two, and I've done that. Um, it, I could cheat a little if I think I could get by with a 3.5 proximally and, and use my energy there. It depends on what the calcium looks like with the imaging. You know, um, the, the key thing with IBL to me is what you mentioned about its use in the sickest patient. We're all nervous when we have someone with markedly decreased LV function. You're worried about embolization, arrhythmias, and no reflow. In the sickest patient, this is so comfortable and easy to use. It really has a tremendous role here. Bobby, um, does this pacemaker or this electrical stuff worry you at all? Or is it just really just an artifact? I mean, you know, there's the case report out there. I read it and, you know, it's like I saw the RNT and I scratched my head and I'm like, how does this 30,000 cases? Is it just not enough experience or, you know, what's the, what's the reality of this? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's something to certainly the ventricular capture and, you know, the, uh, the shock topics are something to be mindful of that it's happening. I mean, in the same way that if you're, pacing somebody with a, with a temporary pacemaker, sometimes they, their blood pressure drops a little bit. And remember, this is a time-limited amount of ventricular capture. So I don't worry so much about the hypotension associated with, you know, a short amount of ventricular capture for 10 seconds worth uh, for these episodes. And then I think about the, the, the R on T phenomenon, which I think in theory we're all concerned about. 
but I'm reassured by the numbers. I mean, I think that we're at the point with this technology, there's so much enthusiasm that every single case that would happen, I suspect would be written up as a case report. We would hear about it because it's, it's such a dramatic phenomenon that would happen. So I'm, I'm like one in 30,000 again. I don't know that that's any higher than the constitutive rate of VF that happens in any of our cases. So I can't say for sure that it's even causal there. And even if it is 100% causal, then I'm reassured that it's such an incredibly low rate uh, incidence. Um, certainly, you know, didn't happen in any of the U.S. studies, of course, much more experience in Europe, but I'm certainly reassured by the European experience. So, you know, I definitely agree with you. I think uh, if I held an IVL catheter while I got a haircut, I could probably publish it. So um, it's, uh, it's certainly the hot topic. Um, Rob, tell me about practical integration into the cath lab. Okay. It's expensive right now. Right. And you have choices. Um, you don't have unlimited money. Uh, what makes you choose one versus the other? One modality. Is it the cost or is it the patient sickness or? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things when we talk about bringing new technology into our cath lab, we talk about managing groups of individuals who will be using these types of products is, at least, you know, from my experience is what does this bring to the table that's novel and how does that justify its cost and what are going to be our use patterns? These are all the things that we have to talk about as a group when we look at these new types of technologies. So we've had these discussions. I've had to come to some really hard realities uh, because of exactly the, the reasons that you mentioned. First and foremost, if you can't get an imaging catheter across, it doesn't really matter, right? Because you're not going to be able to get an IVL balloon across. So that, that for me is pretty easy. If I can't even get my catheter in to image the lesion and find out what I don't know, well, then I'm clearly going to use atherectomy there. So that case is easy for me. Then the question becomes, what does the calcium look like after that? You know, I learned a lot of that from, from you and Rich, frankly, and that was, you know, through this past couple of years using this technology, that is look at the calcium after you think you've modified it, right? Regardless of whether using NC, specialty balloons, atherectomy, et cetera, you got to still look at the calcium because we've all drilled out vessels, then implanted stents and be like, you got to be kidding me. This thing's underexpanded. My MSA is not what I want. And that's really frustrating because you just went through all these hoops to try and do the right thing, right? So I'm always imaging. And it's going to be these cases where I've done something else or I see some characteristics that these other things I might do simply aren't going to cut it. And that's going to be this deeper calcium, right? I know that nothing I have currently is going to change that. And that doesn't matter if I've drilled or not. I know that everything on my shelf, I have nothing that's going to touch that. So that's easy, right? I've got to use IVL there in the right lesion. These over 180, really thick calcium lesions there. There's nothing else I can do. Maybe I can try and take an atherectomy device and bias it there, but come on. Like the predictability of that is ridiculous. And so again, for those types of cases, I think it's easy. Outside of that, we're still having fun and trying to find best use patterns. I'm going to go to Philippe. Um, you know, I filled big shoes when I became the angiographic core lab director. Philippe started there, and you published a lot on this area on, on clinical outcomes. Tell me, um, you know, the reality is we there are some places that are just not going to use intravascular imaging, right? What is on the angiogram that is critical when you're only inflating a balloon to four atmospheres to know whether you've actually done a good job? Yeah, so... Um... Thanks for taking the job. It's very hard, actually. So I'm <laughs> I'm happy to go back to clinical. <laughs> but um, that joke apart. So I think um, for me, obviously, I love imaging. And if I could do imaging before, after, during, I will do it. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a situation where you, you know it's in the expanded. So the case I present, for example, um, if you use 10 booths, for example, and if you look carefully at the angiogram, you, you see the calcium. I'm, I'm like, like... You don't need an angiogram. You see it's deep. You see it's like outside the vessel wall. So, I mean, after looking at the hundreds or thousands of angiogram, you can see it. Obviously, it's better defined by OCT, but I believe there's a lot of uh, information that we can extract simply from the angiogram, and we didn't even scratch the surface of it. So I think we, we, we need to, up to enhance, actually, the angiogram a little bit. And when I use a stand boost with a balloon or a stand, I can see it. Where's the calcium? Um, 
and you know it's deep is you know it's a big nodal and you take two of you and you have like 360 or calcium it's over so you don't need imaging for these i mean when it's like 90 percent lesion and you inflate the three old balloon and it's like 90 stenos you have like a dog bone you don't need angio, you don't need oct to know it's, it's severe calcify so for me i think this is where i, I like to use a non compare balloon and and then and then and then you can adjust your um your technique after, but I believe the angiogram tell us a lot and we maybe the overlook these signs. And, you know, when it is two wall of calcium, when you use the stand boost and you can see that you have intraluminal calcium and it's compromising the lumen and we have outside uh, the lumen calcium, you know a little bit what you're dealing with. But obviously I, I, will, I will not be honest to say that OCT has a better definition and IBIS has a better definition and we shall use these tool if we can. Rich, I'm gonna end with you. Uh, the last question of the day, and that is uh, regarding pulse management. So you got 80 shocks. Most people are going to use one catheter, and you've got a, a long segment of calcium. How much, how many shocks should I sh save to use on the rest of the vessel? And is the four atmosphere inflation enough to tell me whether or not I'd yield it? At, at the end of the at the end of the four uh, atmosphere inflation, we go to six to see if the balloon expands. So today I had a case just like that where I had a very long lesion and I wanted to use the eighty shocks and and not spend another uh, catheter. And so uh, I went segment from segment with co-registration. And after ten pulses, I saw that my balloon expanded fully at four, which gave me confidence that I did twenty shocks per side. So I did four different areas, two shock, two cycles at each area. And I did pulse management. I could have put more, I mean, sometimes I'll do 80 at one shot, shot at one side if that's all the calcium I have at 12 millimeters. But here I had to go along the length of a vessel and I wanted confirmation that the balloon expanded. And once it expanded, then I went forward. So it's using balloon expansion, the imaging information you get that helps you manage it accurately. So I'm going to summarize and first of all, thank uh, everyone who joined, all the participants, uh, Bobby, Rich, Rob, and Philippe. And I think um, what the take home messages from here are, uh, Bobby showed us that the clinical evidence for this is very strong. Uh, the, the culmination of the Disrupt CAD studies show incredible uh, safety and efficacy. Rich showed us that by using intravascular imaging, not only can we see the calcium, but we can prove that we modified the calcium and that also that OCT co-registration or IVIS co-registration can show us exactly where to use our pulses. I think Rob reiterated for me and for the rest of us that this may be the safest modality in the most complicated patient. And that safety may afford us a long-term benefit in that particularly complex patient population. And to be honest, I learned something from Philippe today because I haven't been using the stent boost to my advantage. And I should be, especially when I'm applying the pulse management. Uh, and rather just relying on the regular flow or using that information can be very helpful. So thank you to Wonder. Thank you to Shockwave. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we will see you all soon. Thank you.